اهلا وسهلا فيكم جميعا ويلكم ايفرون سكند داي اوف ذا اريج اوف ذا اريج فورم ان عمان جوردن ويتش ويتش هاز مور ذان 100 جيست فروم اكروس ذا وورلد اي ام ساجا مرتضى فاكت تشيكر and uh, journalists for uh, Arab uh, uh, investigative journalism. Uh, today we will be talking about uh, the regional or global fact-checking networks. Uh, which one should I join? Uh, it's a question uh, raised by every fact-checker across the world. What's the use of being a part of the IFCN? And what's the benefit of being at the same time part of a regional fact-checking uh, uh, fact-checking uh, uh, organization. We have the AFCN, we have the European AFCSN, we have the African uh, 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 network, uh, we have uh, the Latin America, uh, and the Latin American, and all of them are active, uh, work on uh, uh, supporting uh, the fact-checkers in their uh, uh, communities. Today, we are here to answer this, this question. I have three dear guests. I have uh, Angie Holland, uh, director of the international uh, IFCN, the director of IFCN. She worked more than 10 years uh, as uh, uh, editor-in-chief of Politica, which is one of the most important uh, fact-checking uh, organizations in uh, the USA. I have uh, Clara uh, Cruz. Uh, she's one of them uh, in one of the organizations that is uh, very important in uh, Spain, uh, Spain and a part of the European also fact-checking uh, uh, institution. I have also Noko Makato, the executive director at Africa Check, which is also another uh, uh, leading uh, uh, fact-checking uh, import uh, and uh, Africa Facts uh, for fact-checking. When we uh, established uh, AFCN uh, back in 2010, we were asked this question so many times, why are you joining AFCN since the Arab fact-checking inf uh, institutions can uh, get uh, the uh, uh, the IFCN uh, accreditation. Our uh, answer was yes, we need to encourage the Arab fact-checking institutions to become part of IFCN, but uh, at the same time, we are a regional network. We know very well the reality in the Arab world and the challenges the, of the journalists and fact-checkers in the Arab world. We know that the institutions who work in this field, and we know the types of the uh, information and the confusion or the uh, misinformation and and the crisis in our uh, Arab world, one of these uh, was the misleading and the disinformation regarding the war in Palestine, the recent war on, Pal on Palestine. It's ever, uh, since the first day, that's October 7, the network uh, launched uh, an emergency as a uh, 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 an urgent uh, response uh, uh, because of the uh, uh, many uh, uh, wrong or false information. And this response included a number of things. First, we offered the urgent uh, uh, financial assistance to three um, fact checkers in Palestine to and to uh, also secure or guarantee protection for them. We were able to do an international co uh, coalition for Palestinian ch fact checking through the uh, uh, Slack channel Channel, which includes uh, more than uh, 60 uh, uh, fact checkers, including 42 uh, Arab, uh, they're working together in fact checking. We also uh, helped uh, uh, UN uh, in for fact checking uh, of information uh, from the uh, field in Gaza. We've been able also to convey the, uh, the voice of uh, uh, Arab uh, check checker, uh, check, uh, fact checkers uh, uh, focusing on the pressure and the, the mental assistance and uh, uh, mental support also to journalists, especially with the uh, very cruel and brutal uh, news uh, coming from Palestine, in addition to uh, other types of response uh, which we established uh, to um, uh, to try to deal with this uh, huge uh, uh, misleading information in Palestine. Our response was the biggest uh, evidence uh, about the need for uh, this uh, network, fact-checking network. We, uh, since the crisis, uh, uh, we communicated with Angie and uh, we ex we told her about our needs. However, IFCN at the time, uh, because it's an international institution, was unable to work on the ground with fact-checkers 
in the Arab region, and this is where uh, the uh, AFCN, uh, uh, FCN's role came. I would like to ask Angie, what's the difference uh, between being uh, 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 part of IFCN as a fact checker and to be part of uh, AFCSN or, FT, uh, or Africa Facts as a fact checking institution? Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm happy to talk about the International Fact Checking Network and our work with the regional networks. The regional networks are very important to us and we care about them a great deal and, and we want to see them succeed. So I don't see any competition between the IFCN and the regional networks. Instead, I see a relationship of mutual support where we're trying to work together to grow the fact checking community and uh, keep our standards high. So the International Fact Checking Network was formed um, out of a meeting we had in 2014 in London that drew fact checkers from around the world. And we knew at the time that we wanted to use the IFCN to convene a community. Um, we didn't want it, it was, so it was created by fact checkers to empower fact checking work. And, and today, our, our mission is somewhat narrow. We run the Code of Principles. I hope many of you have looked at our Code of Principles. It sets high standards that we believe fact checkers in any country can meet. Uh, it's a standard that is meant to, to uh, point to a fully functioning fact checking organization. I think one of the misconceptions I've seen about the IFCN is that it would be a, the first place you go if you're starting a fact-checking organization. Actually, it should be one of the later stops when you have a fully functioning organization that is regularly publishing and has reached a certain level of sustainability. So we run this code of principles that people can sign on to. We also do the annual conference called Global Fact in June, we will hold our 11th Global Fact Conference in Sarajevo. And then we administer a small number of grants and training programs. Um, but that's, that's essentially the IFCN activities. Uh, so we don't have the same capabilities that regional networks have to work more closely with their partners in the country. Um, but what we do do, and I think we do it powerfully, is that we bring together fact checks across many continents. So in our meetings, we have fact checkers from Europe, from Africa, from India, from the Asia Pacific, from the Middle East, North Africa. And I think there is great power and support in bringing these fact checkers together from these different regions, these different cultural contexts, um, while they share uh, these many um, principles and practices in common. Which now to Clara? Clara, what distinguishes AFCN, AFCSN, or the European uh, network uh, for fact checking from Africa Fact, uh, FCN? Uh, and the other networks. We know that AFCSN has a different method, work method, so or approach. Please introduce us into it. Thank you, Saja. I think we can refer to it as the EFCSN, as the European Fact Checking Network, instead of, of, of trying to go for EFCSN, AFCN, IFCN. <laughs> it's gonna end up being a bit crazy. Um, so I think the, the big difference currently, which, which might change over time, is that we are a much more established organization in the way that we are a representative organization of our members as an association. So we act as the voice of European fact checkers in upholding the highest standards, but also in combating misinformation through media literacy for the public benefit. Um, we are in our first year of life, and yet uh, over 43 organizations have applied to become members of the EFCSN across over 30 countries, and take into account that when we talk about Europe, we don't only talk about the European Union, but actually about the Council of Europe, plus Kosovo, Belarus, and Russia, hence a very big interpretation of Europe, if you want to see it that way. 
Um, I think it's important to point out that the EFCSN exists because there was an opportunity due to the legislation pro process that is taking place in the EU. So the Digital Services Act and the Code of Practice, which are two pieces of hard and soft legislation uh, that are being promoted by the EU, um, say three things that, that meant that the European fact checkers needed to have a representative voice. One is that big online platforms need to integrate fact checks into their processes in order to control and risk mitigate the disinformation that can be found on them. That big platforms need to provide accessible data to fact checkers so that they can do their work. And that big platforms need to pay fact checkers and compensate them for their work. And I think those are three reasons or, or three main reasons for which the EFCSN came together as a formalized association and not only as a regional network of practitioners. Um, we knew nevertheless that if we wanted to represent many different organizations across the continent from very big uh, news agencies like AFP or DPA to very small nonprofit organizations like the one I lead in Spain or Les Ourlinier, for example, who um, is a two people's gig in France. We needed to get everyone involved in decision making from the very beginning. And that means that we went um, in 2022 through a very thorough process in which we gave ourselves uh, a set of standards to be fulfilled. We created a mechanism, and this is very important, for that set of standards to be overviewed by independent parties, so not only ourselves, and we create a complaint process as well. We came up basically with what we call the European Court of Standards for Independent Fact Checker Organizations, which is based on three pillars, methodology, ethics, and transparency. And in order to um, become a verified member, you go under a blind review by two independent assessors every two years to make sure that you are actually fulfilling your commitments. Um, we also have an elected governance body. These are different members. As you can see, it's quite diverse from many different countries across Europe, but also different kinds of organizations. And the governance body is in charge of the final approval of the verified members in the same way the advisory board does it for the IFCN. But it also undertakes relationship and negotiation with the platforms to fulfill that code of practice that we talked about before. The relationship with public institutions, especially the European Union institutions, so that they also uh, uh, fulfill their commitments. We define policy positions so that uh, different stakeholders are, are not uh, putting up policies that are not evidence-based in the fight against disinformation. And we made sure that the different very online, very large online platforms fulfill the code of practice requirements since the EFCSN is also a signatory of the code of practice. Last but not least, and I'll leave it here, the association does not only do all this political thinking around the EU, um, we also encourage practitioners within the network to peer training and mentorships, to do collective research so that we understand better how this information navigates the continent, we set up regional collaborations, and, and we're doing one, for example, ahead of the European election that is very exciting for us because we're going to set up a common database of fact checks to be able to study in depth how this information is targeting um, different citizens across the EU, but also in, in border countries from the European Union. And we act as a support network, uh, especially when it comes to harassment, but also whenever a fact-checking organization in their own country has a problem, we're there to help. And, and the way the EFCSN is set up is that members are very engaged, hence it's not the EFCSN doing stuff, it's the different member organizations of the EFCSN trying to support each other. Thank you so much, Clara. Uh, Noko, in less than two months, we were in Mauritius in the uh, annual conference of Africa uh, fact check. And thank you for uh, hosting us there. We had a number of Arab fact checkers there uh, and African as well. Based on your 
on the experience of Africa fact uh, that uh, has a number of uh, fact checking African fact checking uh, uh, organizations organizations uh, what makes uh, you uh, uh, since you're a part of the regional network uh, how does how does your regional network add to the Africa fact check organization okay so Africa Facts is uh, essentially a loose network of fact-checking organizations from across the continent. Uh, so it's less formal than uh, the, the Europeans next to me, and we are also supporting the work of the IFCN in that through the network, we encourage uh, members to uh, become signatories uh, of the IFCN code. Um, we started at Africa Effects in 2017, and at the time, there were only about two other fact-checking organizations on the continent. Um, the real uh, reason for starting Africa Effects was to promote the practice of fact-checking on the continent. Um, as you can imagine, 2017 is uh, very recent, um, and others had been at this fact-checking uh, work for quite some time. And so Africa was playing a, a very, uh, uh, was late to the game, basically. Um, and so part of this work is really to encourage the work of fact checkers, um, encouraging media organizations to start fact checking units within their organizations. And uh, from two organizations in 2017, um, we had almost over 40 organizations gathered in Mauritius uh, two months ago that are actively doing fact-checking on the continent. And I think that's uh, super encouraging. Um, we, as an informal network led by Africa Check, um, which is its own uh, entity, sometimes people confuse Africa Check and Africa Fact, um, we, we, we believe in supporting uh, through informal means uh, the, 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 the emergence of other fact-checking organizations. But we also now believe in collaborating with members of Africa Facts, uh, working particularly on projects in media literacy, uh, training, which is super important, particularly in times of uh, elections. Uh, when, when uh, 2024 is actually a big year for us in terms of training work across the continent. So the, the regional network offers uh, opportunities to work across uh, countries um, and share best practice and, and, and execute work. And you're not starting from scratch, you're actually using a playbook that exists. And for it, uh, thank you, Shukran uh, Jazil, and thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. There are other uh, fact checking that uh, the other organizations that have uh, joined uh, uh, from uh, Tunisia, from uh, Egypt, from. Uh, uh, Algiers, uh, what type of uh, collaboration having joint uh, uh, organizations, having two different uh, fact-checking organizations at the same time in the continent? Okay, thanks for that. I think, uh, as Angie was saying, the, the, the IFCN application or wanting to be a member of the IFCN should be a late in the process. Uh, it's the final step in your advancement as an organization. I think Africa Facts offers you the sort of early steps. What we also do is uh, assist organizations in preparing for the application process. Um, so that by the time you get to the complicated part of uh, applying to be a signatory, we've held, held your hand uh, and, and guided you and assisted you in, in that process. Um, with with the, uh, the nature of the organization being a loose network, there's very little formalities. Um, we just basically assess your non-partisan status and, and, and your activities, uh, your regular fact-checking work that, that you, you have to be doing. Um, and, and by the time you get to the IFCN stage, you would have gone through 
all of the opportunities to learn a bit more about the signatory process and also to learn a bit more about becoming a fact-checking organization and surviving uh, this work, which is very tough. Thank you very much, Angie. Thank you very much, Angie. IFCN, as an international organization, I'm sure it's funded, it has good funding and organ good organization, maybe more than us as regional organizations. We, we chase uh, to get funds and get supported. How can IFCN uh, uh, support uh, AFCN or uh, the African Fact Checking uh, Organization? So what can IFCN do in order to support the other regional fact-checking organizations? Yeah. Well, the first thing I would say is I think we all agree that fact-checkers don't get enough money <laughs> for our work. So we're all trying to get more funding. Um, when I think about how the IFCN should work with the regional networks, um, we take our cues, our, our guidance from the networks themselves. So. Um, every region is a bit different. Uh, some regions, like Europe, are, are quite advanced, um, and they've asked us to uh, like help get space at our international conferences mm -hmm. so the Europeans can have sub-meetings. They, they don't need a lot of assistance from us on how to write a code or training. They know how to do that. Um, with Africa Facts, uh, we were able to arrange some grant money to support the Africa Facts Conference. Um, we attended the conference. I think um, the fact checkers like to see the IFCN show up to show that we are, if nothing else, that we're hearing the community. We're in their space and we are respecting them by listening to what they have to say and then taking their insights home and integrating it into the world community. So we're not trying to tell the regional networks how to run their programs or um, having a top-down approach. Um, we're looking at each um, circumstance and, uh, and working from there. And the different regions have very different challenges and different outlooks on how they want to work together. Um, sometimes they want to work together very closely and collaborate around specific fact-checking topics. And in other times, they see each other as competitors and they, they want to stay separate. Um, I would say that one constant theme that, that I like to speak to is the importance of fact-checkers as seeing themselves as having common goals. So even if uh, one fact-checking organization might look at the one uh, next door and say, well, I don't like the way they're fact-checking, or that's not how I would do it, or we disagree about a policy <clears throat> issue, um, it is fine to have um, differences of opinions about some of the big challenges that we face. But I do try to tell all the fact-checkers we are stronger together. We are stronger when we are together, when we're cooperating. Um, these are organizations that were founded quite recently. And with the IFCN, we very intentionally have tried to make it not top down. So we ask our signatories to adhere to the principles of fact checking that we all wrote together and that we all agreed on. But aside from that, we don't ask for a lot of agreement on, on anything that's outside of those principles. We want to give the organizations um, their independence and their freedom to associate with each other as they see fit. So again, with the regional networks, we just try to emphasize what we have in common and find areas where we can work together because uh, the forces that are in favor of misinformation are very, very powerful. And so when fact checkers um, come together to pull their efforts, we feel like we get better effects. And so again, uh, I actually ask the regional networks, like, how can we help you? And then take cues from there. 
شكرا كثير انجي هلا بدي انتقل لكلارا ونوكو كلارا ونوكو هل برايك ثانك يو كلارا اند نوكو دو يو ثينك وات دو يو ثينك ذات ذا سبورت ذات يو جيتينغ فروم اي اي بي اي سي اف ان از انف اي اف سي ان از انف اور يو ثينك اي اف سي ان كان بروفايد مور تو ذا ريجنال نتوركس She brought us here to question us on the difficult stuff, you know, in front of a lot of people. <laughs> so um, I think it is. I also think that this is very new for everyone. I don't. It, it's been less than a year since we've been talking about regional networks mm. and how to connect them with the IFCN. So I think I, I don't think anyone has like a very clear view on how this is going to look next year. But uh, at least in, in in my perspective and from the IFCSM perspective, there. Are two things that have happened lately that that uh, should be praised, I guess. One is we've started having more regional meetings while uh, being at Global Fact, and I think that is a very good opportunity to be able to get together. I only recall that happening in South Africa, I think for the first time, but but it was everything was very much linked to the third party fact checking program as well. Um, and, and now that's sort of happening with every region when we go on Global Fact conferences. And the second one is that also regional networks have started to talk to, uh, together, and that's the reason why Noko and I am here, or why we got to go to Mauritius two months mm -hmm. ago. Um, and, and I think that's also an interesting dynamic because I, 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 you and I have talked several times, Saja, on how many of the issues that are taking place within the Arab region have an effect in Europe and a lot of the fact checking that we do has a relationship with the Arab region and, and there's a, a means for collaboration there. And the same happens with the African countries. I, I can think uh, of a lot of narratives that we're spotting on, in Europe that most likely have a counterpart as a false narrative in Africa. And there are things that we can do together uh, further than investigate the foreign intervention that I'm surely is taking place mm -hmm. in all three regions in that sense. So, It's very exciting because we're at the very beginning, but there's a bunch of things yet to happen. Thank you, Clara Noko. Um, I mean, so I think the, the IFCN offers a, a good opportunity when you engage with the IFCN. Um, NG's taken on this role and she's been willing to, you know, hear us out. And that's, that's super important. Um, and as a network, we trying to figure out who we are as a network and where we want to be. Um, and that process will involve other stakeholders, including the IFCN, uh, to offer advice and guidance. But I do think what Clara's point uh, emphasizes is the collaboration between the networks um, from the different regions is super important. Um, we work with Latam Czech here Um, on different projects and we're working with the European network on other projects. And, and as we collaborate, not just as organizations, but as networks, we really build a stronger community. Thank you very much for your question. I just want to add the idea that I would like to add here that uh, IFCN is the incubator of all uh, network, which is basic. Uh, to have the place with the basic principles, uh, the rest, all the fact-checking institutions and networks would go back or would refer to. And But my own uh, uh, viewpoint with the crisis in the different uh, uh, in the different areas of the region, we need to deepen uh, the dialogue and try to do joint uh, uh, projects so that that would have bigger impact under the sponsorship of IFCN. It would have a bigger impact because It would be at an international level as opposed to regional or local level. I want to go now to the questions by the audience. Oh, we have so many questions. Whoever wants to ask, please come to the mic. We start with Tom. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for the presentation. It's um, so exciting to see how far this field has come in, what, like eight to 10 years. And there's, um, that's largely thanks to you all and other people in the room. Um, where do you, uh, in terms of like the maturity, I think it's a really positive thing that there's um, these regional networks being set up with clear governance and good practice and um, supporting new fact checkers to kind of join the community. 
where do you see it in kind of 10 years from now? Like, what do we, what does this conversation look like in 10 years? Are we, are there sub-regional uh, um, <laughs> collaborations? Or I'm just curious for how you see the future. Yeah, Tom, we don't know what to do in Tom, we actually don't know what to do. Uh, we don't know what would happen tomorrow. So Angie, do you have an answer? I think the regional networks are testimony to the growth of fact checking, just as you said. I think we're going to see the regional networks get larger and develop more. I think um, uh, we may see um, more of them write their own codes. Um, I think that we will see what is happening in Europe with uh, more regulations on the tech platforms. Uh, we will see that spread around the world. I don't know if other countries will enact the same type of legislation that Europe does, or if the tech platforms um, just learn to live with the European regulations and then other parts of the world um, get the benefit of practices that discourage misinformation. Um, we will, I'm watching that very closely. And then I think um, fact checking has seen uh, the way that different technologies have changed both misinformation and fact checking for good and for bad. And I, I think, so AI is a great example. Um, AI has uh, enabled the creation of fake photos, um, some fake videos but it's also being used by fact checkers to fact check more quickly and more rapidly. Andy from Full Facts talked about some of that earlier today. So I do think that fact checking is becoming integrated into the internet's uh, uh, ways of communicating. And I don't think that's gonna go away. I think that's just gonna grow. And I hope that it will be very positive. Uh, Clara, do you want to add something? Yeah, sure. Um, so the, the thing with your question, Tom, is that I feel that fact-checking is going to change so much uh, from 10 years from now. Um, I think there's a misconception right now that fact-checking is just rating claims, which is not. I think fact-checkers and fact-checking organizations do much more in the fight against disinformation. And I think that over time, uh, thanks to technology, but, but also I think that the framework around this information and fighting this information is changing is gonna make us be looking, for example, much more at narratives and, and trying to do the bigger story and not only the content rating story, which someone still has to do, don't get me wrong. There's uh, a bunch of AI system, content regulators and companies that are actually profiting out of the work that fact checkers do, but someone needs to find the disinformation piece, fact check it and say, hey, this is false. I'm, so that that can be compared to others. But I do think that, that fact-checking is gonna change dramatically in the next 10 years. Hence, it's very difficult to answer your question. <laughs> Loco? Um, yeah, I wish I could tell the future. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I agree with Clara. I think fact-checking is changing as we speak. Um, so what that looks like 10 years from now is a bit challenging. But I do also think in environments or or, or regions such as uh, where I'm from, there's, it's still in its early stages. And so, you know, you've, you, we're sort of catching up with uh, a, a, a project that's really moving very quickly. Um, and so what the picture looks like 10 years from now is really challenging to figure out. Oh, and as about the diff, but I would add, I'm so optimistic about the idea that fact-checking uh, is uh, developing and growing, institutions are improving, uh, regional uh, networks are also getting or expanding. As much as I have concern about what we're seeing in Palestine, the government's uh, the misleading uh, information and the uh, uh, technol technology uh, uh, companies that are uh, accelerating this kind of misleading information, uh, and this is by itself, uh, this by itself is a challenge uh, uh, for the next years. I think we need to focus on this because otherwise things would go in a negative uh, uh, direction. Yeah, thank you very much, Saja. Thank you very much. My name is Ajibola. Uh, my question is actually for everyone. I want to find out from you guys. By the way, I'm from Nigeria. 
and I also participate in fact checking um, efforts in that country. So, but some studies are coming out now showing that fact checking perhaps is not gaining some kind of attraction that one would expect it to gain in the sense that you have people making disinformation this time, and then the next time you fact check it, and then another round of time, the same thing you fact checked is being circulated again. Meaning that the response to fact check, I mean to uh, misinformation by fact checking is not getting as much traction as one would expect. And I would like to hear from you guys uh, what you think should be the next kind of response to the spread of disinformation, especially around the election. Because in my country, we experienced that a lot. In 2019, there was misinformation, we fact check it. And then the same thing that we fact checked, again, we circulated in 2023 election. So, Kran Noko, sir? Oddly enough, that question comes up quite often at conferences. Um, and, and, and yeah, again, the, the challenge with misinformation is it's such a big, a uh, big one that we have to really find different ways of tackling it. Um, and, and, and again, the work we do is more than just chasing after claims to prove or disprove them. We really have to deal with the uh, uh, supply side of misinformation and also the demand side of, of misinformation so that you inoculate uh, communities against misinformation. So whether misinformation circulates or not then becomes meaningless because people know how to distinguish between facts and fiction. Um, and so, yes, that will always, misinformation will always be there. It's been there since the beginning of time. Um, so how we respond to it is really what's important. Uh, Clara? Clara, especially that you have an election soon, so. <laughs> I think there's one thing that we need to consider um, when, when we hear all these things about fact-checking not being um, scalable enough or that is, of course, it does not only depend on the fact-checking organizations, which are usually very small, uh, non-well-funded, non-profits uh, working on their own, trying to fight a bunch of things. Um, I think that Collaboration between fact checkers and other stakeholders is what makes the difference. And, and I have one number um, that I think is very substantial to this. Within that risk mitigation mechanism that the European Commission has put in place or has, has made the very online platforms put in place, um, the third party fact checking program, which is an association between fact checkers and meta uh, across the globe, fact checking content, we, we find this information on Facebook, we tag a fact check to it, and then Meta does uh, three different things with that. One is they reduce the, the visibility of that piece of this information. They disable, um, the if, if it's a repeat offender, they will disable their monetization schema so they cannot put advertising to that piece of this information. But the most important one to me is it tells anyone that is trying to share that piece of content to be aware that that has been fact-checked by an independent party and it's disinformation according to that fact-checker. What we've seen in Europe is that 30% uh, percent of people that are about to share a false content and that pop-up comes up, stop sharing it. And I have not seen that number in interventions against disinformation in any other kind of project for now. I wish there were other uh, good solutions, but for now, this one is one that is quantifiable and that has made a change, together with media literacy campaigns and, and more public awareness in general. Shukran, Clara. Tfadali. From Sada Social for Digital Rights in Palestine. My question uh, I always think about after October 7, we have seen many uh, uh, 
media platforms who published misleading or fake information. I know that fact checkers, when they do the fact checking, they would go back to these platforms and say that the information was incorrect and they would correct them. My question is, since we were talking about change and the future changes, what is the change in this particular issue that we can rely on or maybe in relying on uh, credible uh, institutions, uh, especially on X, uh, there is uh, the so-called uh, community note. Uh, they are uh, fact-checking the information, of course, relying on the Palestinian narrative, uh, comparing uh, with the uh, Western uh, media and uh, proving uh, false, uh, some uh, uh, and uh, this is for you, Angie. I would like to ask uh, how can we uh, can we create trust again? CNN, after we've seen CNN and um, and others lying, uh, like uh, the beheaded the baby story, or uh, or the uh, and BBC and others, although they've uh, um, apologized later, is this apology uh, enough? What, how can we retrust them again? I think we're seeing some dynamics that are very common in the media across many types of conflicts, which is that initial reports are often wrong because of the intensity of trying to bring news as soon as anything new happens, and that there is a, a corrective process that happens. I mean, in the United States, we've seen this around reporting on mass shootings, that often the initial reports are incorrect. Um, they attribute wrong motives to the shooter. Um, and I only bring that up as to say, I think this is what it has happened in some ways in this conflict, in that some of the initial reporting has been wrong and then has had to be subject to correction. Um, I, think, I think that, I mean, clearly there's an fact-checking element of that where journalists are all fact-checkers and they all need to do their due diligence. Um, but I think what you're talking about is much bigger than our fact-checking field. I mean, it's a problem really for um, all of journalism and for war reporting in particular, that when they get these initial narratives wrong, it can create a lot of suffering among the audiences, among the participants, among the victims, so that it really underlines um, how important it is for the frontline journalists to try to get their initial reports as correct as they possibly can. Shukran, Angie. Bad for had Hadan. Any other questions? Thank you all. Hassan from Lebanon from Sawab uh, platform. My question to you, uh, since the establishment of uh, this uh, platform, there was, uh, uh, they communicated with many of the journalists and their correspondents in many of the countries. But how can we witness in one day a, a network that uh, would be the umbrella of all continents for any fact checking or a, a person or organization in any continent uh, during crisis, uh, during uh, the daily events, uh, without uh, going into uh, challenges uh, can we can we make it to this level one day can you see this happening i think uh, angie this question is for you how can ifc and uh, the communication between all fact checking organizations around the world during crisis I, I think we are seeing some of these issues being worked out today and and right now I mean, certainly the Arab fact-checking network is much closer to this issue than the IFCN is. Um, so I do think that as we see more fact-checking efforts that are more closely um, watching actual events, um, that, will, that will create better fact-checking. Um, I do think that we need to remind ourselves that this internet that has connected us all with such uh, quickness and fastness is a very new technology, relatively speaking. I mean, this is something that has happened in our lifetimes. And I think very much all journalists and especially fact checkers are working out now the standards for accuracy on the internet when we have a, a worldwide community unlike any we've ever had before in human history, as far as the 
the speed of communications and the volume of communications. So going back to the first question about fact checking in 10 years, sometimes I think about what will fact checking look in 50 years or 100 years. I, th I think it will take that sort of time frame to work out standards for accuracy and trust on the internet. And I know that might be a little depressing thought for those of us who are older and may not live to see the day when we have these better standards for trust and accuracy on the internet. But I think that is what all of our work today is pointing toward. So uh, I don't have an answer for you today, but I do think that this work is part of the process of getting towards a better tomorrow. يعني يا توم نتمنى انه بعد 10 سنين نقعد هاي القعده نفسها ونجاوب على هذا السؤال <تصفيق> بشكل اوضح. So I, I hope I hope we will one day witness this uh, day coming. Thank you Clara, thank you all, thank you for the panelists, thank you for those who are with us online and thank you very much. The next session will be at 5 in 15 minutes. Thank you very much.